Welcome to the Silver Screen Guide Podcast, where we discuss films from every genre. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the podcast. Today we are discussing Ghost in the Shell, the new movie. Yes, that is the title, the new movie. Such a silly name for a it, movie. It, it's a, yeah, it's silly. It's a very confusing. <laughs> Instead of the sequel, it is the new movie. This is your co-host, Corbin. I'm Alan from Chicago. This movie was released November 15th, 2015. So this November is coming up on three years. It's been about two and a half years. It doesn't feel that long, though. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it, I didn't realize this came out so recently when we went to, when I put it on the schedule. Yeah. This does beg the question, though, but what about the other movie? I forget the name of it. There's one other movie that exists for Ghost in the Shell, and the thing is, you we can't find it. It's some, I think it's called Ghost in the Shell, the standalone complex. The uh, Laughing Man? What? The Laughing Man? No. Oh. There's a different title for it. Hmm. It's the... Essentially, the TV movie for Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex. Problem is, we can't find it anywhere. Right. And, okay, so there's a kind of another problem is I had no idea that I needed to watch Ghost in the Shell Arise 5 to yeah. get the full context of the story, nor did I realize that I needed to... I didn't know these characters were introduced in the Arise series. I guess I didn't know there was the connection. I kind of figured that there was something that this came before. I think... Because, okay, I watched it with one of my roommates one time, and he mentioned, he's like, hey, this is... Have you seen Ghost in the Shell Arise? And I said, nah. And he said, that's what this is continuing off of. So I... From then on, I was like, ah, okay. I can see where things in the show... Uh, would be in this movie a few characters here and there that we never see again the logic i think it's called logicomas uh they're in here never seen them they aren't really built up there's a few things in here that are here but don't have any uh build up to them totally in the tv show apparently or in i guess the arise i think they're called ovas those arise episodes ah that explains it because we'll get into it yeah but okay so this movie is also production ig uh production ig i guess is kind of done all of them i don't know if they have anything to do with the live action movie yeah i am not entirely sure i actually can't remember i guess we'll find out when we get there though the movie is directed by kazuya nomura and it stars Elizabeth, well, for the English version done by Funimation, stars Elizabeth Maxwell, John Swasey, Christopher R. Sabat, Alex Organ, and Brandon Potter. I I don't know, maybe I should have listed more people, but I didn't know where to cut off, so. Yeah, yeah, OCE is not back to direct this movie. I guess it makes sense, it's off of the Arise uh, TV show. So the director of the original two movies is not coming back uh, yes. to direct this one. But uh, I mean, we'll get into specifics here soon. But y you can tell oh, Oshii yeah. really wasn't on this project. Oh, no. Or if he was, he had very little influence. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the music is done by Cornelius. We do not have uh, Kawhi back. Yeah, that is also unfortunate it's that's pretty obvious yeah so <laughs> yeah. this this was one of those special limited release movies uh, as far as i could tell it was only in theaters for three days so pretty much over a weekend in 267 theaters nationwide and it is granted like i said it was only in theaters for three days so it is the lowest grossing of the four theatrical films with about a hundred one thousand dollars yeah this one was more or less just straight to video it probably had like you said a very very limited uh theatrical run uh just to appease some of the fans but this and then the other standalone complex movie that i mentioned earlier they were both just straight to video it does seem odd that they did choose to put it in theaters for three days. That just seems like too much work to do for that. Yeah. The only thing I can guess is it was just some kind of special event. Maybe to say, 
maybe it was even for the new Ghost in the Shell movie that is coming that came out in 2017 with Scarlett Johansson. I don't know. Maybe that's the reason why they just, for whatever reason, they decided that ah, we can put it out for a few days and get some money out of it. I don't know. That that's the only thing I can really think of. Well, before we get into the plot of this movie and discussing it, we do want to let you know we have a spoiler alert. So if you have not seen Ghost in the Shell, the new movie, and you would like to not have it spoiled for you, then go ahead and click pause right now. Go ahead and watch it and come back and hit play, and you will be ready to talk about it with us. So I can't really give a plot for this movie because I was following it at first, and then we started learning about characters I had never seen before. I had no idea where these characters were coming from what these plot points meant it all seemed like i had started the movie <laughs> halfway through <laughs> so yeah. alan did go ahead and watch it twice and i did want to say i did watch the first uh 20 minutes I, I watched half of the first arise episode which did help me a little bit because it introduced the characters and they're not a part of section nine they kind of hate section nine i was so lost during this movie uh, so many characters are like, oh, these are pre-established characters. As far as I can tell, this really isn't a standalone movie, but could it be enjoyed as a standalone movie without seeing the uh, Arise 5, Fy Fyro 4, Colt, or whatever it's called? Right. So the plot is a little bit messy, but I'll try and make some sense of it. We begin allegedly in the past... Uh, Major Motoko before she was really known as Major Motoko. She's, I guess, having dream sequences. We kind of see her back in like this kind of like an orphanage place. Uh, we you see her help out this girl who had fallen out of her chair. Um, and then we see these two little girls on a bench holding hands. This will all come back later. Uh, this kind of just goes to show, at least I think, where Major kind of came from. It's odd, but we'll get into that in a second. We have the we also see Major kind of running down this, like, flower maze, which will come back later. Anyways, cut to Newport City, AD 2029.3. Interesting time. Uh, so what happens is on the tele on the newscast, we see that there has been 11 hostages, or sorry, uh, hostages taking, that have been taken by 11, uh, essentially what we come to find out as military men, uh, they've held them hostage. I think it's 42 of them in this building. And so our team, it's Major Motoko now. She's been granted uh, money to go and save these, ho save, these ho save the hostages with her team, which, in which includes Bato, Ishikawa, Togusa, and a couple other new characters that I actually don't remember the names of, uh, which I'm guessing are were pretty much announced in the TV show Arise. And they also have these new gear, these new like robots called Logic Logicomas that help them out on the missions. Essentially, they pop in and they uh, are ordered not to kill the, uh, not to kill the military men. Uh, they want to save them and question them and things like that. So they are ordered not to kill. Come to find out, they uh, were all there to, essentially, they were trying to hold the Ministry of Defense being renamed to something else. Like it's, they think it's something along, along the lines of uh, the Defense Association or something like that. Basically, they're getting the Ministry of Defense is getting a downgrade, and they don't want that. Well, we they try and find the culprit uh, who was behind all of this, and they're gone. They find some friendly fire. Come to find out there is a girl there uh, who has been controlling all of these men and then took control of three, pol uh, three politics, uh, and they took down the 11, 11 men, 11 military men, because they were controlled by this girl. We come to find out is known as Firestarter. She had cloned Mo, uh, Major Motoko uh, and stuff like that. In the meantime, the prime minister and a girl named, uh, it's K something, it's like Kusu, uh, Kusuragu, um, he gets blown up. They import this suitcase or they have the suitcase that he's supposed to be using for a basically a treaty talk with him and an ambassador uh between them they were trying to get these um essentially they're trying to get the proto the uh lines for production when it comes to cyber brains and stuff like that they're trying to keep those 
on par, even with, even though technology is kind of advancing past that. They want to keep technology at a bay. Well, they get blown up. Somebody sabotaged the mission. And that was the real intent the whole time was to try and clear out military stuff and uh, basically restructure military the military in, I think it's Newport City here and stuff like that. Well... Come to find out, there is uh, this also this thing called the Third World. We find this out partly by uh, Kusaragu, and then we also find this out later on when Major goes and visits the the orphanage again. Third World is essentially human brains living in a sea of information, and they are basically the whole idea is for this to come true. They want to have uh, the, the kids from as far, as far as I understand of the orphanage. They're supposed to eventually get to this point they're supposed to join and uh that is their future this is what kusurago ended up setting up for them and things like that and through a series of really interesting events uh come to find out kusurago was remote controlled by what we now know as the fire starter who was remote controlled by this girl named chris which the major visits in the orphanage chris had orchestrated this whole thing all sorts of stuff like this she dies in the end uh I, by having water put onto her, um, and then the major surfaces, and she tells the kids at the very end that you're, if you're going to survive in this world, you have to learn to give up something in order to get something, and that's basically it. It's a interesting plot to say the least. Well, yes, that's quite interesting. That does clarify a number of things for me. There's still. There's still two things I'm confused on. I, I'm I'm really confused on when they infiltrate that like giant ship. Right. So they track essentially they track down. Um, if I remember right, they track down that one of the sources of all of like the remote control stuff is happening from this ship. Come to find out, it's kind of just all a ruse. Uh, Major finds out some information, um, so that way she can essentially do this by herself now she disbands her crew as far as i'm as far as i understand and as far as i I think what the movie is going for is it's more or less just an incentive to give kusanagi the reins to the rest to the ending of this movie kind of gives it makes it a bit more personal that she knows this certain information whatever it may be okay did you ever understand who the twins are at the end the two black girls. Yeah, I knew that they were from the beginning, but I didn't really understand anything past that. Okay. Yeah, like I already mentioned, from what I read, this storyline is a continuation and end of Ghost in the Shell Arise 5 Pyrophoric Cult, where this Firestarter virus comes up and whatnot because this is a continuation of that is that what you found out as well yeah essentially i kind of find it well really the whole arise tv show story is all about firestarter and they're just kind of trying to track down who exactly is firestarter they think it's a virus and stuff like that kind of find out they did track it down in this one firestarter as we come to find out kickstarts the uh puppet master in number one okay so, okay. <laughs> I was wondering if it was supposed to tie into number one or not. And especially in the end of this movie, I'm like, this is a really strong remake of the end of, or the beginning of the first one. So right. is that what you got? This movie is technically supposed to tie into the first one? Because I also, I understand this is kind of the beginning of how section this group in section nine comes to form right so the beginning of number one and the ending of this one are actually not the same they're meant to be they're meant to look very similar and i got confused the first time i watched it was like did they just remake the beginning of the first one not necessarily the case uh essentially the ending of this movie is they found who set this whole thing up who got fire starter out and who was the one who uh basically began this entire operation and so that's why we see section nine the leader the chief of section nine go in and try and apprehend the man is because uh this is before they begin they, this is before this group joins section nine um he's the one going in 
and doing those operations before they joined. And so, yes, it is very, very similar to the first one. But in reality, they're just arresting the man who basically started this entire fire starter thing from the get-go. Okay. Yeah. And we see this man a couple other times in the movie, um, him reacting to a couple of things that happened. Uh, right. He's quite subtle. He's only here once or twice before he's eventually taken in and arrested or, I guess, killed in this part, in, in this case. Okay. So I also thought the be- the opening of the movie was odd. There's no dialogue. The the visuals are very interesting. I like the use of colors. Uh, it's very uh, it's just very it's a strange vision. This yeah flowery indoor orphanage, uh, mechanical and whatnot. I don't really understand what's going on. It's an odd opening, but. I did also find myself, uh, well, no, I'll save that for just a minute. I was also disappointed to see the, I was expecting a cool opening like we had in uh, one and two that showed creation somehow, the mechanical fused with the organic, uh, the spiritual and the physical, the ghost in the shell. Uh, We didn't get that. Yeah, instead it's just, bam, ghost in the shell. And then we're done. Uh, yeah, this opening is a bit odd, although at first I was like, okay, well, I can, I can get into it, you know, thinking that there'd be a more, a deeper, more philosophical meaning all behind it. Not necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just kind of, I guess it's just kind of here to appease, uh, the TV show right. and, and stuff like that kind of un- get us to understand this is where the movie's headed. It serves more as a past for Motoko than it does for really anything else. Um, it serves to set up a couple people that we'll find out come back later. Um, but for the most part, it's just set up. There really isn't much to it except for that. There is no philosophical context really anywhere in this movie. There's a couple of points, um, that I'll try and point out when we get there. Um, but yeah, this opening, although like, like you did say, it does look pretty good. It, it's kind of underwhelming. And then we oh, have sure. the title screen just kind of splash up there and it's like, it, wh- I I got a bit confused because I was expecting there to be a big opening, like you said, with creations like that, right. that we've seen two times before this, and we don't get that. And I'm like, okay, well, this is on the TV show. I'll give it a bit of a pass, even though I would I would like to have that. Yes, this is, you can immediately tell by many of the opening scenes that this is kind of a swift departure from the previous two, because this movie seems to focus more so on the action and adventure aspect instead of the drama between the characters or internally within themselves and yes there is action in both previous two movies but that's not really the focus it's mostly uh i yeah i was not prepared for this at all i was really thrown off and i'm I know I wasn't too keen on the previous movie, but I'm feeling a lot more keen on it now. (laughs) Good, you're coming to my side. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I kind of agree. This is... Okay. Sure. Swift departure, not what we've seen before. I can... Okay, I can deal with that. I'm curious to see where they're going to go with this, but... Whereas in the first one, like you just mentioned the action, uh, in the first one, it feels like, okay, well, yes, there are action sequences, but because of how they execute them and how they work them into the story, there is great weight to them. They they feel like they are necessary for this to happen, for the story to move along. And I would even argue the same with the second one. There are things that happen that I feel are almost needed to happen to move the story along. This one is not that same way. And the f- opening action scene with our heroes essentially going in and saving these hostages feels like it feels like this is where the movie was. This is where the movie's real intention is, sure. not necessarily on more phil- on the more phil- philosophical aspect. And so, this action scene for me just goes on for way too long because we find out at first, oh, can't shoot them, can't kill them. Oh, wait. The, the guy's gone. Where did he go? Oh, no, friendly fire. It, like, one thing adds on to another, and it's just like, okay, well, where are we headed? Right. Where is this ultimately leading to? And it kind of has uh, a, a through point, but at the same time, 
because we're missing some of the philosophical stuff, it feels like so whatever, you know. It stay it does stick with the more political aspects of stuff, but we've skipped out now on the philosophical na- nature. And I will say I enjoyed all of the action scenes in this movie. I thought they were really exciting. They were well choreographed. Uh, I thought they they were well done action scenes. But I do agree with Alan. It's you you start to think where is where are we going with this? What is the purpose of this? What are we building to? And that's kind of what I was just I just kept thinking that more and more throughout this movie. And it I'm sure if I would have seen a uh, pyrophoric cult, then I would have been more invested in this story and in the characters as well, because I was expecting maybe some type of character setup or uh, just more setup to the story. But we really don't get any setup to the story because it's not uh, – the beginning of the story it's kind of the latter half of it so i thought the same thing as well also i was uh at times i i enjoyed the animation uh aesthetically but it's nowhere near the same level of animation as one and two i think uh one is completely gorgeous two is as well in its own way and i love how they're similar but they're both very unique in how they look this honestly feels like an anime uh, I would see on a TV show. It Yes, I would absolutely agree. It didn't really do much to uh, garner any type of uh, theatrical exhibition to see this type of uh, anime. Uh, another thing that I wasn't very pleased with this type of animation is some anime uses this kind of like glow effect around characters or just in certain scenes where everything seems very kind of shiny almost. I, I was disappointed to see the animation was not up to par of the previous two theatrical films. Right. I'm going to go back real quick to what you're talking about the story because first time around I was just like what what is happening and then yeah, second time around I began to pick up and I will say that the core story is I found to be quite interesting because at the very beginning Kusanagi uh, Major Kusanagi that's um, Motoko and then uh, Kusaragu I think is I can't remember how you say her name uh, they have two. They have two differing views on a central issue, which is the third world. Essentially, what is happening happening here is that the third world, being that it's basically a sea of information, people can live in this place where they don't have physical bodies. They can essentially live forever. Major Motoko wants that to just be free, whereas Kusuragu is wanting to lock it down, give it more of a standard, things like that. And I found that to be, okay, well, that's interesting because uh, it. in one way, they mentioned this, that if you go down Major Motoko's route, it kind of becomes complete anarchy. You go the other way around, you have so much control that it's almost not even usable. And so it created a, an, an interesting conflict to at least begin telling the story and then we get into all the politics and stuff like that which is where it gets a bit confusing but i found that to be interesting that they were going to go down this route although not nearly as interesting as the other two plots that we've talked about and i found a lot of things to be very interesting in this movie and i really wanted to know more i think where my issue came in is we get bogged down with quite a few side plots that to me make it hard to discern and see the central thread of this movie and once again that may be because this is not really a standalone story it is coming off of, it's it still requires seeing the previous installment which i wish they wouldn't have built it as such as it is and kind of marketed it this way because i found that to be very confusing and uh, I'm sure on repeat viewings, I could get the central thread of this story, but because we have elongated action sequences and side plots with characters I've never even seen before, I it it really makes it hard for me to see the central story. I understand they're dealing with the fire starter and the prime minister being blowing up, but I have a hard time being invested, if that makes sense. 
because yes. the movie is making it a little difficult for me to latch on to that because I feel like we're not we're spending too much time on five different plots instead of making those a little more streamlined and showing us how those all connect together. Instead, I especially towards the latter half of the movie, I'm just left scratching my head on who are these characters? What does this have to do with anything? What what is even going on? Yeah. Yeah, the psych it, it, unless it's a character that is in the next uh the next two movies cuz this is a prequel. Um then there really isn't anything to them. Uh, we do get some develop. Most of our time, obviously, has been on uh, Major Motoko uh, and her story uh, because this is basically her movie up until about ten minutes. But, anyways, we'll, we'll get there when we get there. My the problem is, I do agree. There are a number of side plots that begin to do tr- to detract from following the story as a whole. On a second viewing, it makes a lot of sense. Okay, well, they need to go down this route because this, this, and that to get back to the original story. But I feel like, okay, well, now we're losing the audience because there's this movie is so dense in all of the wrong ways that it just becomes straight up confusing. Because at one point, the movie, the team splits up and they go a couple of different routes to find out different information. And it kind of cuts back and forth between the three groups. And I'm kind of left wondering, okay, well, how does this all connect? I don't know this character. Who is this character? Oh, I guess he's part of the team. Okay. I forgot that he was even here, you know, and then they all kind of come back. I mean, in the end, it, at least it all somewhat fits together, but I think like you just said, there is more to it than what we're seeing because it's also coming off of a TV show. And so that has a lot of things building up to this already. This is just pulling those pieces all together. Also trying to tell a, also trying to tell a movie at the same time. And now I'm confused because there are things we just go off and go off somewhere else and then come back and it's like, okay, uh, what, what happened? And, had they made this a bit more streamlined, they would have been easier to follow. But even on my second viewing, I'm just like, ah, but, ah, but how? I can only imagine it's the TV show that has, that ex- it explains this on a deeper level than this movie does. What did you think of the character redesigns? The two in particular I was drawn to um, was the Major and Bato. Yeah, I actually ended up liking the way the major look. It, I mean, it's kind of meant to show her as a y- more younger person. Right. That didn't bother me. I wasn't too big of a fan of Bateau, but I mean, that also didn't bother me too much. They didn't feel like terrible redesigns. Like they redid the entire character. They just felt like a slight update. And I agree. Bateau, I didn't really care for his redesign too much. It's nothing major, but once again, it's something about it he just didn't seem as tough maybe uh also the major looks very similar to how she looks in standalone complex but she does look quite a bit younger than we've ever seen her before and i think she's almost too small in this one they just made her body size too small because it doesn't make any sense because she's an adult so how does she become so much bigger in the other ones i know it's just fiction of course but nevertheless she was just too small of a character i like the other major was she seemed more developed more mature looking i enjoyed that better yeah i i think well since this is this is a prequel i gave that a bit more a pass because it, it felt like oh major hasn't completely been hasn't completely matured yet her body isn't completely developed yet uh, they are cyborgs, so I they don't ever explain how that works. Right. But I, I gave it a bit more of a pass because it felt like, okay, well, this is a prequel anyways. She's probably closer to her teens than she is anything else. Um, so, yeah, the redesigns make her look really young, but I think that was kind of the, the intent. At the same time, though, uh, they don't feel like major redesigns. They just kind of felt like a slightly updated for 2015 design. The one character that is, he looks nearly the same in everything that he's been in, is uh, their sidekick, who is still more human than anything. What What is his uh, name yes. again? Uh, Tagasa. Yeah, he uh, he just always looks the same to me. 
Yeah, he does. I think he looks a bit more different in two, uh, but only by a little bit. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, what did you think of the voice acting? Uh, this is not the same voice as the doing the major, same lady. Yeah, yeah. I picked up that really none of these voices are probably going to be the same. Uh, I think this is one of the better one of the better voice actors of the major that we've gotten. Um, but when it comes to really any other character, I would say that the the chief of section nine doesn't do a very good job. No, nope. um, doesn't sound very good. But Toe is okay for the most part. Has some moments where he's not really the greatest. Um, really, those two uh, Ishikawa is fine. I didn't really have any, very many issues with him. Togusa is he's fine as well. I mean, he isn't the greatest, but yeah, the other two people of the team I really didn't mind. I really didn't care for at all. I agree. Uh, Bato isn't as good as the guy who voiced him in the previous two movies. I did right. miss hearing the original Bato. Yeah, the leader of Section Nine isn't very good. I I enjoyed the the new voice actor for the major. I thought uh, she did a decent job, and I didn't have an issue with anybody else. I did uh, I did have access to the Japanese uh, version of the voices voice acting. And I preferred the voice actors for the English version. I do enjoy watching uh, anime in Japanese. That's usually my preference is to go with the original Japanese. But this time, everything felt quite flat. There wasn't a whole lot of expression expression in these voices, which did make it harder for me to connect with the characters. And I thought that was unfortunate because there's some really great uh, voice acting uh, in Japanese animation, the one of the most recent ones I saw was Erased, which is an incredible TV series and has some great uh, Japanese voice acting, which I prefer to the English. So it was, I I didn't really uh, care too much though because I have never watched any of the Ghost in the Shell movies in Japanese. I've watched them all in English. Yeah, I've yeah I've seen the last two in Japanese. I've also seen them in English as well. Um, well, except for two. I never, I didn't get to see that one in Japanese. This one I only saw in English. There wasn't a Japanese option on Amazon Prime when I rented it, which is unfortunate. Um, but yeah, I mean, English voice acting, it's Funimation. So at the very least, it's just pretty good. And this one, I right. would say, is pretty good. I think it at times is better than the original. And at times, it's also not. They kind of are almost on the same plane for me. Uh, they both have strengths and weaknesses over the other one can't say the same for two i haven't seen that in english uh, also this movie has no nudity there was quite a bit of nudity i guess it wasn't technically nudity per se but close enough in the first one that was toned down in the second one but there's still some sexual aspects to it whereas there really wasn't any sexual aspects in the first one and this one uh doesn't go there at all which i was expecting there to be some but there wasn't and honestly this does feel in a way the more i hate to use the word kid friendly version but more so the all ages version that anybody can really watch and not be offended by any of the content in this movie i i would say yeah this one it doesn't okay, okay. It doesn't bother me that there's no that there's no nudity in it, and really this movie doesn't even call for that, anyways. Right. The second one, I would even say the same thing. There is maybe a little bit, but it's still rated PG thirteen, so there's not much you can really do in terms of nudity. First one, uh, first one is the first one. It's kind of all on its own. But yeah, I mean, this movie never really asked for that. It doesn't really need to have any of that, and it never really goes there, which is which is nice because they, there's just no reason for it to be there. But at the same time, that kid friendly aspect, I would say, not not in this aspect of nudity, but just in general, comes back and it's just like, oh, okay, because at least in the second one, although still rated PG thirteen, it really did push it as far as it could go. It, it doesn't feel like a PG-13 movie. It just feels like the movie was doing whatever it was, what it needed to do, and just happened to be PG-13. This one, I feel like they made it to be PG-13 because there is oh yeah, there is points in the movie where there is violence, and it does either doesn't show it or it's off screen. Um, where in the last two they've shown it all, and in this one you don't really feel any of the weight when it comes to like punches and stuff like that. Whereas in the other two, you definitely feel that there is some kind of realism. This one, 
not so much. It feels like it's just getting there to so it can be with all audiences, which doesn't really work, unfortunately. During the first action scene is when my attention was called to the score of this movie, and I hated it, and it didn't go away. I, I can't even understand why they contracted this guy, and they've let him do it for all of our eyes, and still this it's horrible. Yeah, this is... The score is not good. And that's so unfortunate because the last two scores have been great. And coming to this one, not only do we not have Kawhi back, but we have a different guy with a different mindset as to how a, a score for Ghost in the Shell is to work. Okay. All right. Whatever. Don't have to have the same uh, Bulgarian harmonies. Don't have to have the same jet older Japanese styles and still have a good score. That's that's fine. You can still do something good out of that and still keep it more ghost in the shelly, but it doesn't it just feels so generic. Oh, like, yeah. okay, we put action scene number one score here, action scene number two score, and then the next one. And it just kind of feels like they made it on Garage Band and then put it into this and put it into the movie. It doesn't feel special like the other two movies do. Also, did you ever feel like there was too many characters in this movie? Because Coming from the previous Ghost in the Shell movies, there are minimal usage of very many characters. It's really just Major, Bato, the section leader of Nine pops in sometimes, and uh, their friend who I just can't remember his name for whatever reason, Aizawa. Tagasa. Oh, Tagasa, Tagasa, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he uh, He's always a constant, and he's also in standalone complex but it's really those but i gotta say i did like their team in this movie i like them a lot but there's also a number of side characters aside from them where i don't even yeah. understand them and it's just too much to keep track of yeah there are a lot of characters here and compared to the other two which are very minimalistic in their main characters this one has we have oh yeah those four uh major uh togusa bato Ichikawa, those are the main four of the team. Chief of Section 9 comes in a couple of times. He really plays, uh, doesn't come in any more or less than he does in the other two. But then you also have the other two guys, maybe three guys, that are, on, are also on this team. And they have just about equal amounts of screen time as Togusa and Ichikawa do. And I really could care less about them. Uh, and then, of course, you every once in a while have the logic comas come in, which are just like these robots on wheels, and I can't stand them. Um, yeah, there are a lot of characters here, and we can't forget Chris, so we can't forget uh, Kusuru, whatever her name is, starts with a K at the beginning with the pink hair. There is a lot of characters here, and some of them get the short end of the staff, but in all in all, it didn't bother me terribly much. I just wish... It was a bit more focused on just the core team and not trying to make it bigger than what it should have been, which is kind of what ends up happening. Right. Those uh, things that roll on wheels, like those uh, arachnid-type things with the little girl-type voices, yeah. those are taken directly from Standalone Complex. And yeah. I feel within the context of the TV show, they are a fine addition, but in a theatrical movie, they're not a welcome presence because once again, it clearly, they almost set the tone sometimes with how they're used in such a fun way of swinging around, jumping around, having fun. It really changes the movie, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, we probably should talk about the tone because very different compared to the other two that we've talked about because this one's definitely more playful and oh, yeah. definitely not as serious as the other two and whereas the other ones were quite serious uh quite dense and very thought-provoking this one no <laughs> it's very oh, playful and it's just it kind of clashes with the movie because we'll have moments where we get very dense dialogue with politic uh, political talk and everything like this and then we have the logic comas coming in and screaming, and it's just like, okay, now we have clashing tones. Oh, yes, extremely clashing tones because there is some great action that can be intense, but then it is immediately uh, shifts tones because it's interrupted with some a lot of fun, lighthearted uh, playfulness, and... 
I don't know. It this movie is just uh it's just I don't even want to say it's fun per se because I feel like that's not even what they're trying to go for. That's not really the intention. And like Alan said, the previous two movies had some really heavy subjects and even some dark subjects, especially in the second one. This has none of that. Right. This is just uh, almost more of a Tron type movie with the virus and this Firestarter master control program. And they have to stop it, but they also have to deal with a bunch of other things that I just don't understand. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there, and this is kind of where the plot, I think we should probably start talking about the plot, because it is dense, and there's a lot of political talk. Honestly, though, this is kind of interesting. I found myself to enjoy the movie more on a second watching than my initial one, because in the first one, I just felt like I'm kind of just left in the dark. This sure. dialogue makes just no sense. Who are these political powers? How do they connect with one, with one another? How is the prime minister connected to the Federation, or I think it's called the East in East Asian Federation? How is this all connected? Second time around, I begin to pick up the pieces. I'm like, okay, this is where this comes from. Uh, that I'm beginning to understand. But even then, there is I'm pretty sure stuff that's explained in the TV show <laughs> that is, isn't explained here that would help to know if they had talked about that more. So half an hour into the movie, I was really struggling becoming invested with the plot and i just found myself wishing i was watching the first ghost in the show and then right after that i put in my notes what in the world is going on and that just pretty much uh, says my thoughts for the rest of the movie and i'm sure i would understand it better on a second viewing but this movie does kind of make it hard for me to want to do that more so i uh would prefer to watch the pyrophore cult and then watch this movie again and kind of get the full story that way. But yeah, there was things I did really like that I was extremely fascinated by. What what does what is the connection with this orphanage? What is this girl that kind of drowns herself in this massive chamber in this thing? I wanted to know more about that. The twins are protecting her, but she thinks they're against her. Uh, there's a lot of things introduced here at the end that I, I didn't understand, but I'm like, this is really fascinating. And, uh, kind of the usage of colors in this movie, I liked that. Uh, the other movies, uh, had their own set of color palette that worked really well for it, but it was nice to see, uh, something different. Yeah. This one is very much more cartoony than the other ones are. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think probably my the thing I found to be the most interesting was the discussion of the third world because that just seems really interesting to me that you can basically upload your, I guess, ghosts is what they considered in this movie. You can upload your ghosts to the net and just live on this sea of information, as they say. That is interesting. And they go, well, they kind of go into uh, the ethics or the political side of how this is even possible, how do we regulate this, how do we make it free for everybody. That's interesting stuff, but there's maybe five minutes spent discussing it. Everything else is more or less just trying to piece together how one politic is connected to another politic, or how one federation is connected to the prime minister. You're beginning to see the picture here. There's more time spent on creating more of a political movie um, than it is creating a more ph philosophical movie. Not necessarily to push any kind of agenda, but more of just, okay, well, instead of telling, instead of teaching the audience a lesson or getting them to think on a level that you would never have thought about, they're more or less just trying to make, they're skipping that part while trying to keep the political side of Ghost in the Shell that has existed in both movies. And the problem is, it doesn't really work here because... In those other movies, it used those political uh, talks and things like that to, re to ring in the message and to ring in those philosophical ideas. This one skips that, and it kind of just makes for a very dense, convoluted movie, especially on the first go. And honestly, I almost considered that to not come back, but I ended up doing it and was able to piece together some more stuff. But when you all when you really think about it in the grand scheme of things, 
I'm not learning much here. And the lessons that we do learn are one-liners. And it's just kind of like, okay. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, the third world, or what was it called? The third world? Yes. Okay, the third world. I know the first movie referenced scripture, so the when immediately when I heard the third world, I was thinking of when Paul in the New Testament is talking about the third heaven, how he talked about being caught up into the third heaven. That's in Second Corinthians twelve two. So I was thinking maybe they're playing off or deriving a similar aspect here, where it's more of uh, a non physical. Uh, area where you will eventually go to they mentioned pray that uh we will go to the third world i think they did say that in the movie and yeah that none of this is explored at all which uh frustrated me because this is another thing that is incredibly intriguing and there's all these little nuggets here where i feel like they're their own stories but they're just kind of mashed together here at the end and it's like they're each t- trying to tie up different story threads, but I just don't feel satisfied at all. And it's just left me wanting more. Uh, they did also talk about borders, how cyber brains will transcend borders. And I took that to mean a person cannot be detained within a body within a national border. I found that to be interesting. I know the first arise is called border and... Uh, that would be very interesting to explore further, but once again, I think that's explored in other Arise things. This is just kind of taking little nuggets from that as well. And right. like you said, there are a lot of one-liners in here that uh, some of them were very good. Like the one at the end where it says, the truth is a weight we must carry. I thought that was great, but once again, it's just kind of her talking to people and just throwing out these little things or I didn't understand her interaction with the kids uh, at all except for that one line I appreciated Uh, I also thought it was a little cheesy when they would say follow your ghost yeah The, the usage of ghost in this movie takes it to a different area that I feel like we've never it's never been in the previous two because Bato looks inside of a guy's head and said, uh, he has no ghost, or where did his ghost go? And that made me question whether the ghost is a physical object. Plus, they're using ghost here as meaning to follow your heart, follow your conscience. I never took it to be either of those things in the previous two movies. Yeah, I think really the, the whole meaning for the word ghost is more or less for the soul. Uh I never really got the notion that they were changing the way that we look at the word of ghosts in the series because there is a line that Bato says where he says, I'm not the kind of guy who is willing to follow his ghost. If I can't see it with my own eyes, then it isn't real. And even that alone, it's like, okay, that's interesting. Please explore that. And they they don't. They just kind of leave it there and he walks off and go to the next scene. But regardless, uh, the ghost aspect of this is simultaneously talked about more but not explored any more than it already has been. And that's also kind of an issue because uh, this is called Ghost in the Shell. And we find out that these, go- that these, I think really what the whole thing about this is there are different uh, cyborgs that are now being con- remote controlled by the Firestarter, right? Which comes out later when Firestarter becomes the puppet master, but that's a different movie. So in my mind, The ghost aspect, I don't think it's given a a different definition, but it's more or less they're just touching on it on a very surface level way, whereas the original, the other two talk about it in great depth and more more philosophical context. And I don't need a definitive explanation as to what their ghost is, but I do feel after three movies in, I'm still feeling too ambiguous about this ghost and its actual role how do how do they get it where does it come from where did it like where did it originate what can it do can is it just for is it like a cell phone in your head is it your soul i feel like it's almost both sometimes and i just wish they would have more of a solid vision and portrayal of what this ghost is and i feel like i've never completely got that 
I'll tell you one thing. It makes it a lot more clear on repeat viewings, especially a one and two. The ghost, the, the, the definition of the ghost is never explicitly stated. It's very much a metaphor for different things. Um, could be a conscience, could be uh, more of a human-like soul. There are different ways of going about it. Uh, the movie, the movie, these movies are never, their goal is not to explain what the ghost is, rather create and create a situation or create a story that goes around it to explain it and ex- and describe it and things like that. It's more the theme of the first two doesn't do that here. They just kind of talk about it. And then that's really about it. I thought the final scene was interesting because it was a extremely close visual callback to the opening scene of the first movie even so to the point we know it takes place in as far as i can tell the same area maybe even the same building because where major is falling with it which is the last shot that like circular driving area is the same one as in the first movie as far as i could tell and they're clearly it was really uh, close to being the same, so much so that it confused me. But I was like, no way, this could be the same. This doesn't make sense. But uh, I don't know. I don't know why they chose to remake that in the end. Yeah. Now, there is a point in time uh, Major essentially disbands her group. She gets on the ship, finds out information, and then says, well, okay, well, I'm going to handle this by myself because she saw something that did something and she disbanded a group and for about 10 minutes she's just gone she just doesn't show up anywhere we see the fake motoko come out every once in a while and do stuff but for the most part she's just kind of gone and then she shows up and this is and it's the scene when she fights uh the fake motoko yeah. one time that i feel it probably could have ended but instead, we keep it going, and she fights this gang that I can only imagine shows up on the TV show. Yep. And then at the very end, she does fight the fake Motoko, but only for about five seconds. And then come to find out that it's remote controlled. And yeah, at this point, there's a, there is a point in time in this movie where it just completely loses me. And that would be... So when she visits, when she visits the children um, back at... like I think it's called... I think it's the orphanage... Um, that's kind of where the movies lost me. And instead of exploring more of the stuff we were just talking about um, in the scenes prior with all this political talk, we've now finished that for the most part. And we kind of just jump right into just pretty much straight action from here on out up until the very end where we get some kind of uh, some kind of closure with this one guy, this diplomat that Major takes out in the very last scene. This is where the movie just completely loses me. And I'm just like, oh, well, okay, I guess I'm just at this point wait, ready for it to be over. Yeah. Uh, after this, I was just waiting for it to finish. Um, this uh, ending scene is just confusing because it looks too similar to the one that we get in the beginning of the first one, but it's not the same. I don't know why they decided to do that, but whatever, I guess. Yeah, this ending is confusing. I did. This is when it kind of went to crazy town for me, where they just wrap up like three or four different plot threads that I felt like we never even started to begin with. That was, it's just a really weird feeling with the orphanage. And she's like, we have to get to the orphanage in time. And then she goes underwater to deal with that. I don't understand that. She gives advice to the orphanage kids. The guy who runs the orphanage is arrested. She has a, a terribly done fight with her clone, which I was just like, oh my gosh, where did this come from? It's just out of the blue. Hey, here she is. We're fighting on the docks and it's over. And I just felt no resolution to any of this or, uh, yeah, I, I am completely lost here. And this just further like solidifies it for me. I told you 30 minutes in, I wasn't invested. Now I'm really not invested and I, I can't be, I can't be invested with a story that is it, like, I'll explain more with my final thoughts here. I don't want to repeat myself, but I completely agree. This last 30 minutes or so or 20 minutes, I'm just completely lost. I can't even pick up on these story threads with the the twins and uh, I don't know, this robot. Yeah, and as far as I can understand, the whole reason for the story is so that way technology can take a backseat to advancing prosthetics and cyber brains 
because those two aspects are always falling behind new technology and stuff like that, and they can't implement stuff. That's why they want... This is so confusing. That's why they want to get people onto the third world. That way they don't have to worry about upgrades in the future because their minds are just more or less information. They're not anything else other than that. Yeah, this is confusing. I'm sure the TV show would explore this more and make it a bit more streamlined and easier to understand. But for a standalone movie coming off of really nothing, it I don't think it does a very good job at explaining where we're at before we start the movie. A good example of one that does this very well is the Cowboy Bebop movie or Cowboy Bebop knocking on heaven's door, just depending on where you're at. This is not one that is very that does a very good job at getting you to understand, okay, this is where we're at and this is where we need to go and kind of quickly explain and recap what the TV show was talking about and then explore that and for the movie's sake doesn't do that here it just kind of just jumps right in gives a little bit of an a little bit of an explanation but not one that really works well and i'm surprised for the theatrical audience they didn't even give any type of opening text because with the previous two movies we have had opening texts that kind of give some context to the world that we're about to see right. this one just jumps in and they're hoping you have watched four and a half hours of the previous show <laughs> right so alan what is your rating and recommendation for ghost in the shell the new movie this kind of feels like a rogue one rogue one scenario where the movie is not necessarily needed but exists to make the next one that comes after it better unfortunately without the context of the tv show this makes very little sense and is quite hard to follow. The philosophical themes are absent for almost 100% of the movie. We have small little nuggets that are very interesting. And this movie at times looks very, also looks pretty good. But at the same time, it is nowhere near the level of the other two the movies that we've talked about. Though those movies look, I would even say, spectacular. This one just feels like almost any other TV show anime that you could find in 2015. At times it looks really good, don't get me wrong, but for the most part it's just kind of blah, you know. And that goes with the movement, it goes with the character, the way that the characters uh, move, it goes with the way that things are animated, it just doesn't really feel like the highest quality of animation that those other two movies had. That aside though, we were to view this from a movie coming off of the coattails of a TV show, I can't even really say that it's really all that good because it's kind of boring. It has moments where things are just overly cheesy. The logic comas are ridiculous. I'm glad they didn't, that they didn't overuse them. All in all, this is just not a compelling story to tell because of what's come before it. This feels, at the very least, it feels like a Ghost in the Shell movie, but it feels like one where the director didn't exactly know how to express more philosophical ideas, so he scrapped it and went for the, instead took just the political side and explored that instead. Just so we can set up the first movie, which we really didn't need in the first place. All in all, I mean, I guess if I went back and watched the show, perhaps I can get more out of this movie. It would make it better. And I really wouldn't even doubt that very much. But as a standalone movie, it's E. It's I don't know if I like this. I don't think I'll ever come back and watch this one again. It's fine. It's got its good moments. But overall, six out of ten. I don't even know. Mild recommend if you've seen the TV show. It's got some redemptive qualities in it, but for the most part, it's nowhere near the other two. And I, would, I wouldn't come back to it, but I would say it's an interesting watch. If you really want to, I guess. Yeah, Alan and I are pretty much of the same mind on this one. We both are on the same page, but we've got some mixed feelings about it. So Ghost in the Shell, the new movie, is interesting. It feels like watching the last episode in a TV series. <laughs> I did realize this theatrical movie carried with it the prerequisite of seeing, if not all five Arise hour-long shows, then at least the last one called Pyrophoric Cult. I was saddened to learn this is not a standalone movie, and in order to know the characters and even get what's going on, you'll need to see Pyrophoric Cult or watch some Arise to know the characters. 
With all of that being said, I found this movie to be incoherent. It's like watching Side B of Godfather Part 2 or The Lord of the Rings without first watching Side A. Yes, it has some fantastic visuals and heart-pounding action scenes, but without knowing how the story got set up, these characters and plot meant nothing to me. I was... I was lost the entire time and couldn't get invested in the plot. Now, I will say I am extremely intrigued to go back and watch all of Arise. That remains to be seen if I'll actually do it, because I haven't made very good progress on Standalone Complex, which is way better than this. I found Ghost in the Shell... Uh, I did find Ghost in the Shell Alternative Architecture, which is the original four episodes plus the Power 4 Cult, which ties in with the new movie. That's what Amazon said. Uh, overall, I'm giving Ghost in the Shell, the new movie, a not recommend, since it cannot be enjoyed as a standalone movie and requires prereqs to understand the movie. Since I have to give it a number, I'll give it a 5 out of 10. Well, so my question now is, Corbin, did you ever go back and watch number 2 again? Uh, so I was definitely planning on it. I got super busy uh, helping out with uh, different things, and I didn't. So I think it's expired. Darn. So I'm really sad darn well that's unfortunate <laughs> i will go back and watch it i absolutely will yeah um i've seen the first one three times now i i keep thinking mostly about the visuals of the second one how those were just incredible and i can't wait to yeah. go back and live in that world with those visuals again and hopefully glean more from the story upon uh not having to constantly just keep up with the plot and dissecting it i can more so just absorb it that way i can't say the same for this one i won't be returning to this one unless i go back and watch Arise, and then maybe it'll cap it off but it's alan kind of hit the nail on the head there's nothing really compelling to go back to any of this stuff uh i gotta say standalone complex deals with some deep issues deep philosophical issues that I found to be fascinating. And that was done in, you know, 30 plus minute episodes. So if you want some ghost in the shell with some really great characters that are kind of more akin to the original and philosophical themes with the original, go uh, check out standalone complex. It's really well done. Yeah. And I would love to buy the Blu-ray for number two in a sense, but it's a bit, over my budget currently um hopefully it'll come down eventually yeah but yeah i I would love to go back and watch number two again i like i think i mentioned that podcast not as good as the first one but still very very intriguing so do we want to i guess it doesn't really matter at this point because it's kind of obvious but do we want to kind of give our uh listing of which ones the list of which ones we like and uh which ones from best uh from best to least favorite yeah sure we can do that and i'm gonna be really interesting to see where my list updates when we see the scar joe movie yeah uh, here soon but and i do kind of feel like in a way these movies if you just want some great philosophical stuff go with the first one if you want philosophy and action go with the second if you just want action go with the third Albeit you'll right. be quite confused with the third, but if you yeah. just want some ghost in the shell action and you don't want to have to deal with the philosophy stuff, then that that's the one for you. So I think that's kind of unique that we've kind of got one of each and then a hybrid to go with. But right. my list uh, should be pretty obvious. It's one that's a super high up there. Two so far has taken a sharp drop off a cliff because of how much philosophy they try and cram down your throat without being organic about it uh that was annoying and then the third one is uh yeah yeah it's at the bottom yeah i'm kind of the my list goes in the same order but not as drastic of drops not as dramatic uh, for one and two yeah i have one and two or it just kind of goes right down the line one two three um one is the best two is not nearly as good, but still very compelling and very thought provoking. Um, three is off the cliff for me. <laughs> it's not really anything that you, I don't think, you need to be seen if you enjoy the first two. Uh, comes at me because I just really like philosophy and I really like, like talking about that kind of stuff and exploring uh, different ideas. The the third one just skips on. We'll see what happens with number th- with number four in ScarJo. Uh, I'm 
pretty curious. It's been a while since I returned to it. Ever, I know a lot of people will say that they like it. Uh, I remember when you and I watched it once, we were not too f- fond of it, but maybe our opinions will change when we see it this next time. I'm, I'm kind of curious. I'm actually pretty curious, too. I'm thinking after at least seeing this one, my opinion will change of the next yeah. one. <laughs> but so are you still giving this movie a recommend? Yes. What? <laughs> but, and I'll explain why. If you've seen the TV show, then it'll make a lot more sense. And there's enough here, I think, to get some kind of enjoyment out of if you still want a dense movie, but also one that is still got some action to it. That doesn't mean it's very good, but I would say it's at least somewhat enjoyable. It's a very, very, very mild recommend. Only if you really feel like you have to or you feel that you really want to then fine go ahead but other than that i really wouldn't go near it but even if you haven't seen the tv show you still think that this is recommendable because there's still enough here to warrant a watching at least one potentially if you really don't mind piecing together a story you might have some enjoyment of it like i said my recommend is quite on the edge of being not recommend but i think that there's at least enough here to have some kind of enjoyment albeit it's quite confusing listeners i'm super intrigued to know what you thought about this movie is this a worthy ghost in the shell movie please let us know in the comments below i'm really intrigued to know what other people thought of this movie how it aligns with the rest of the series and does it stand alone is it a standalone complex you uh, might say. Is it com is it complex to stand alone? Yes. Yes. Actually. <laughs> oh yes. Well, thank you for joining us on this review for uh I was about to say standalone complex. Unfortunately not. Wish it was. Uh, uh different one. <laughs> thank you for joining us for our review of Ghost in the Shell, the new movie. We will be coming at you very soon with our review of Jurassic World The Fallen Kingdom. That will wrap up our Jurassic Park retrospective series. For the time being, anyway, the third film was greenlit, so that that retrospective is not completely closed for good. It seems like any retrospective is not ever completely closed because 30 years later, they could come back with a new movie. You never know. Yeah, that's just kind of the thing. They're all somewhat open, and they will be for a while because sequels get made. And especially in this day and age, everything gets a sequel. So Exactly. So, listeners, once again, we want to thank you for joining us along this ride with Ghost in the Shell. We will be coming back to, I guess, for now, cap it off with the Scarlett Johansson live-action American Ghost in the Shell movie. Like we said, we're both very curious to see how our opinions have changed on that. We've, we've both seen it before. So once again, thank you. Hit like, hit subscribe. You don't want to miss anything. We love talking about movies with you. Follow us on your favorite social media platforms. Just type in Silver Screen Guide. Uh, Once again, thank you, and we'll catch you next time. I gotta pee again, really bad. Gosh. Oh, that's on the that's on the recording. That's awkward.